pole. More dancing, more, more dancing. dancing. <laughs> right? It's been one of those weeks, right? It feels Oof. like, what is that? Um, I believe it's an African proverb that says, um, hard times require furious dancing. Yes. I don't want to misquote it. I think it's Audre Lorde or somebody in that wheelhouse. You know, I know we've Mm -hmm. talked about it a couple of times and that's why I decided to include it. You know, we talk about um, mental health and today we're talking about physical wellness, but we know how well those go hand in hand. Right. And before in middle school, I started laughing once a day to help me with my depression. Now it's the dancing. Right. Let's move this. Move it out. Let's move it. Move the energy around especially episode 127, you know, we're using those tools. Whew. Right? Yes. Right. How are you, my friend? I am grateful. You know, thinking about mm-hmm. heart math and definitely starting every day, centering gratitude, making sure that I'm holding my non-negotiables and writing those down because that helps. And dealing with a lot of news, you know, we are getting ready to publish the audio book for volume one, getting ready to publish volume two, getting ready to start on another big project. And of course, with all that good news, somebody else passed away. Right. Mm, I'm so so sorry. Yes. Getting the opportunity to live the life of our dreams, you know, the life that we will fight for and super excited to do that with you and that we've taken this year to work in the business. The business is, you know, it's been great. So Right. Right. And and, you know, I used to say holding it, but we're not using that words anymore. We're acknowledging, exactly. right. acknowledging both the grief and the gratitude. Right. right? Yeah. Um, we know for a lot of people, ourselves included, this has been just one heck of a year. Right. And everybody I know is dealing with three to five major things. Yeah. Like not even like we're talking major in here. Right. Like, Whoa. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, yes. it's a lot. Right. So. And that's why I love doing this with you, you know, and talking Mm -hmm. about physical wellness and the different dimensions, because what to do is a real question. You get to those situations and you're like, I don't know, you know, who knows? You get somebody who knows what to do. So um, just being intentional on a daily basis and then being able to allow yourself to feel how you feel. And reading through volume two has been amazing. Seeing the layout of the book and Mm -hmm. the, the resources that we have, you know, what happens when emotions come up and how it feels physically in your body and letting it be um, something that you can partner with and teach you something. Thank you, Eileen Dillon, for your research on emotions and how to change the the energy, you know, and that's what we're doing. So I'm grateful to be connected to the resources I need. I love that. Should we do our official introduction real quick? Because I am excited to get to our show today and especially to our guest because I just can't wait to introduce our listeners to her. Let's do it. Let's do it. Hi, ladies. I am Shannon Mitchell, a Black millennial entrepreneur and Amazon bestselling author, the founder of Shalo Glow, an all-natural handmade personal products company that helps women with dry skin glow from head to toe. I'm a champion for your self-care, business care, and intentional wellness. Hi, y'all. I'm Christine Gotro, a white social justice advocate, an international speaker, coach, Amazon bestselling author, and dancing social worker who helps you upgrade yourself and community care. Together, we are a podcast rooted in the eight dimensions of wellness and the co-founders of Women Connected and Wisdom Community. And we like to get together every week with expert guests for intentional conversations about how to be wise in business and relationships and wellness. Like, how do we do this? Yes. How do we maintain it? You know, sometimes you can do something like you talk about that pose in that picture, right? Y'all, I was at this pose for like a second and we caught it. (laughs) And how do you get back there? How do you maintain it? Right. Yeah. You know, you and our listeners know I've been on the road a lot this summer. Yes. And last week, I was um, at the Parliament of World Religions in Chicago, oh. Illinois. How and, was it? Um, it was fabulous. Um, two years ago, I had presented there. I was one of their speakers. This year, I was there in support of our interplay group and um, my colleague, Shwinka Rahim, who has been on the show before. I think yes. she was in season one. Breathe and, in without love. Yes. Right? Bebo love. And yes. I was there to... Um, be one of her performers in her interplay performance, which was just ridiculously fun. Mm -hmm. And I got to the end of the week and I was exhausted. And I was like, 
you know, I, I love to travel. So usually I don't get that exhausted. And so I was checking in with myself, right? Mm-hmm. Am I getting right. sick? What's going on? Mm-hmm. Well, then I looked at my step counter and um, Chicago is a walking city. Like you walk a lot of places and then you're at the convention center. You yeah. walk a lot of places. Exactly. You're catching public transit. You walk a lot of places. So two days in a row, I walked seven to seven and a half miles and I averaged four and a half miles a day. So How talking many steps about, was it? Oh, four and a half miles. You know, it's, it's a lot. I know, four and a half I miles a day is, is close to 10,000 steps. Right. Because a mile but, is five tomatoes. That's what I think about, right? 5,280 feet. So if you're okay. walking, I can only imagine how many thousands of steps that is. <laughs> but I was, it was a good, so I got home on the weekend and I had a good night's sleep in my own bed. And the next morning I woke up and my body was so happy. My body was like, yes, to that physical wellness. But when you're in it, you, first of all, are like, what's happening here, right? Yeah. Um, Courtney, hey, Courtney, hey, Coach so Cove. glad you're with us. Hmm. So glad to see you today. Yes. So, yeah, I just wanted to share that out since we're talking about physical wellness today. Because, you makes know, sense, sometimes when you're in it, it doesn't feel that great at first. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's the reality of it. You know, this week I was talking about the pressure that diamonds have to be under. Right. And I, I thought about this growing up and as a band nerd, I'm practicing, trying to make section leader. And I'm like, you got it. You got but you got to keep practicing. You better practice your skills because there's 12 of them, you know, and I still messed up. Um, I talked about that when I went to hire. I'm like, oh, hurt. Um, but I still got <laughs> section leader and what you do is enough, you know, and realizing that with the pressure, sometimes you need the the time and the situation to figure it out. You know, so when we're in the middle of the situation and we're like, okay, let me notice instead of judge what's going on, what is this situation for? If it's for my good, right? Mm -hmm. It's uncomfortable, but what is that teaching me? How do I take that energy and then um, transform it into something else, something that I can use in the, in the wheelhouse of things that I have control over? Like still point talks about sorting and separating this. Mm -hmm. Okay. I cannot control this. Right. But I need to process it if it hurts to continue to heal and be whole, right? But then what can I do with this? I love uh, Cecile's coloring books. You know what I can control? What colors I color these little circles in, (laughs) you know what I mean? And so doing that with my body helps my physical wellness, helps me decompress and um, I can more clearly go to the next step. I love that. Let me give a shout out and the definition that we're working with today for our listeners. So, Physical wellness is the ability to maintain a quality of life that allows you to thrive in your daily activities without undue fatigue or physical stress. Physical wellness recognizes that our daily choices, habits, and behaviors have an impact on our overall health, well-being, and quality of life. So those daily choices and habits, which... I'm excited to talk to our guest about because um, of her book and that some of those, I, I'm, I have a question about those daily choices in regard to her book, but I'm going to hold it. I'm going to hold it. Yeah. I don't want to give anything away. Okay. okay you want to introduce so, her? Yes. Let's talk about who our expert guest is. Today, we are going to be talking with Kelsey Blackwell and Kelsey Blackwell MS is a cultural somatics practitioner and author. She's dedicated to supporting women of color to trust and follow the guidance of the body so we may powerfully radiate our worth, dignity, and wisdom in a world which sorely needs this brilliance. As a facilitator, coach, and speaker, she's brought abolitionist embodied practices to diverse groups such as Riders on Bay Area Rapid Transit Trains, to students at Stanford University, to the offices of LinkedIn. She works one-on-one with clients as well as leads the eight-week program, Decolonizing the Body. In addition to being impactful, Kelsey believes working toward personal and collective liberation must also bring joy. Welcome to the stage, Kelsey Blackwell. Welcome, Kelsey. Thank you so much. Yeah, happy to be here. Thank you for that beautiful introduction. Absolutely. Thank you for your work. Can I also give a shout out because um, Kelsey and I are part of Interplay and that is how we met. And um, I am just so delighted to have you here today, Kelsey, talking about your new book, Decolonizing the Body, and what it means in regards to physical health. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. It, it's always a treat when I get to share space with you, Christine. Um, and it's so nice to get to meet you, Shannon. And I really appreciate you, your willingness to share my work with your audience. And Absolutely. oftentimes when people ask me, like, what is decolonizing the body? Or what do you mean by that? Um, I think giving just a general definition of what I'm talking about when I say decolonizing the body is helpful. And so when I'm talking about decolonizing the body, essentially, it's looking at how we can reclaim what it means to be human by reconnecting with the ancestral wisdom that already lives within us. So there's this sense that we are fundamentally whole and complete. And um, there's a pathway for us to tune into and trust the wisdom we already hold. And so that's what, what we're exploring and what I'm supporting women of color to do um, through my work. But truth be told, this journey of decolonizing isn't just for bodies of color. This is work that all bodies can be engaged in. I tailor my message to women of color because that's my lens, right? I am a biracial, black, cis, queer woman of color. And so I, I'm going to speak from my social and racial identity. And, and that's why I um, tailored my message to that audience. But I do believe that there's information in this book that all bodies could find relevant. I will second that as a white woman who has read your book. It is, yes, there is, there are resources, there is um, wisdom in there, just like you said, that applies to all of us, especially because of the system we currently live in. And that's what I was thinking when I read the definition about our daily choices. And um, the question that was coming up for me, Kelsey, is like, if we're not intentional about it, how, see if I can ask this the right way, like how much unconscious the the white dominant culture and colonization, how much is it impacting our daily choices <clears throat> if we're not being conscious about it? Right. Yeah. Great question. I think many of us can recognize the symptoms of what it means to live in a colonized body. And that's one of the things, it's actually a list in the book of symptoms. One of the, I'll just list some of them. So some of the things we might find is that we are always hustling. We're always in go mode. We don't know how to relax. We don't know how to rest. We don't even know, like when we get those moments for self care, we find that we feel anxious, like there should be something else that we should be doing. Um, there can be this um, pressure to always be taking care of others. So it's almost like we're disconnected from our own needs, because we're always attuning to what are those outside of us needing? And how can I be of service to that? Uh, another symptom is not really even being able to feel our own bodies. And oftentimes there's a sense of this, like, oh, I know that my body is trying to communicate with me. Like I have these aches and pains that show up, but I don't know what to do with that. And so I kind of numb out and I keep going. Uh, the mind is very, very active, very uh, always thinking about what could happen or regretting what has happened. So really hard to be in the here and now. Um, what else would I say? Um, so just as there's a disconnection from the body, oftentimes th this is also expressed as a disconnection from land. So we, you know, humans are designed to live in relationship with our natural surroundings. Um, but we've been taught through colonization to fear the wild and to try to control or tame the wild. And so 
we might find ourselves like not really having a, a connection with the, our, the landscape that we live in, not knowing the names of the native plants, not, not, you know, feeling the seasons, but not like living in sync with them. So, I mean, so many of us experience these symptoms. And part of the reason that I wrote this book is as a coach working with women of color, I started to see the same themes popping up over and over again. And it was like, oh, okay. Like there's something that so many of us are experiencing. And how how did we get here? And what would be the journey to reconnect with our bodies and reconnect with the landscapes that we're living in? What, what would that look like? I have a question for you, but I wanted to hear Shannon's voice if she had a question first. Um, okay, okay. You ladies know I like to take notes. So, so mm-hmm. I don't know if I have a question. What I was thinking <clears throat> that I would share on is that everybody needs it, right? It's almost, we talk about physical wellness. I think about Shalo Glow, the first chapter, we're talking about the different books, right? And that's what I shared on, Kelsey, my Shea Butter company that I shared on at the beginning. And because of Shea Butter, if you know about it, a lot of people think that it's like a Black people thing, right? But just like Christine loves your book, she loves Shea Butter, she's a gardener, the sun, outside, all these reasons that and things that all of us encounter, no matter what our skin color is. Now we know that skin color plays roles in other facets of the environment that we live in. And we have to stay cognizant of that, of the colonization, the mindset, the conditioning, everything that we're talking about. But if you're outside, you still need to be protected. And if you're in the dirt, it's still gonna affect your fingernails, things like that still happen to everybody, right? And so what you said earlier about everybody needing it reminds me of something one of my professors said when I went to Kennesaw State. And it's that you don't have to tell a fish that it's in water. It just knows how to swim, right? So sometimes we don't even see the water. And so everybody that's in the culture grew up here. So we all got the same stories, which is why we follow some of the same things and are conditioned in the same way. And so for not being intentional about it, I think that it will lend us towards not being able to help but operate in that system if we are not intentional about setting up our own system. And so if it's teaching us to go, 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 it's very intentional to say, right now, I'm going to take a still point, right? Like your first book, Christine, right now, I'm going to take a second and take a big belly breath like Cecile talks about and trust trust that I have the breast for the rest of the day the day to figure out the rest of the of the day, you know, that is all of us. And so I think that's also part of why Women Connected in Wisdom and everything we talk about has been so impactful to women and the men and the cultures around the world and all this stuff, because we have to unlearn it and reprogram ourselves in how we want to live our lives and recenter it there. Yeah, I mean, the water that we swim in is such a good analogy because it is the water that we swim in, right? We live in a culture that actually requires us to stop feeling and to keep going and keep doing. And it says that the more we're able to accumulate, the more value we have. And so, so many of us are hungry for that acknowledgement, especially if the narrative is that your body isn't worth anything. So you're going to work especially hard. You're going to chase after that carrot with the most fervor so that you can say, hey, I made it. I made it. But what they don't tell you is that there is no arriving. Right. You never get to that place where you can rest. And for me, that was The Alchemist. And so, spoiler alert, if you haven't read it, right, 
he went around the world looking for the gold and then he got back to where he was sleeping at the beginning and it was under where he was sleeping. It's under the rest. Just rest in this moment. You're going to run around the world, do all this stuff for years. And it's on top of just, you know, start with where you are with what you have and you might be surprised at what you find right here, you know? Um, But when it comes to our, our worth, I think that's why, it helps me stay centered. And of course that comes from my faith in my worth as a person. And we talk about, we've talked about on the podcast before uh, the secrets of six figure women. And I talk about it in volume two, actually, because it really helped show me that a lot of people align, like you're saying, Kelsey, their self-worth to what they make. And I saw in the different positions in the hierarchy in high school and band and all these different hierarchies, how people treat you differently, knowing that, I'm amazing if the the water is running at home or if I have to brush my teeth in the chemistry classroom didn't change the type of student I was. I was still an honor student. What does my water being on have to do with my brain, (laughs) you know? Um, But knowing that I come from a place of intrinsic worth and I'm worth everything that's on the way to me and still remembering that other people might not think about that. That's where I'm excited about our conversation because that is where the, I think, lack of rest comes from and how do you do both is difficult intellectually. And that's why I'm talking about intellectual wellness in this chapter to hold, hold both of those in your mind at the same time sometimes. Well, and I have the curiosity if our bodies can hold it. Right. I think about, um, I think about when you said that list, Kelsey, I was like, Oh, I resonate with that list. Um, but so much of it is before interplay, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I still run at a pretty high speed, especially with my ADHD. It's just the, it's the speed my body likes to go. You know, often in interplay, we talk about the speed of the body and everybody thinks that's slow and my body likes to run fast, right? But the difference since going to body wise practices and some of the things you talk about in your book, um, the difference is is when I am having those moments of rest, when I am, I have my daily practices that I start with, that I am at peace, that I am checking in with myself and what does my body need or want before I'm out here flying all over the world, right? It doesn't have to be an either or for me. I think it's a, it's a yes and, but so much to be grounded in those birthright practices. And yes, I was thinking about it this morning because I'm here with my nibblings who are four and I started singing because they were um, they were not wanting to go to school. We'd been having a great morning. It was a 530 a.m. wake up call. I was shocked, but um, (laughs) we were having a great morning. And then right when I was transitioning them to get ready to go to school, they started to, you know, get a little there was a little kerfuffle and um and so I started singing using some of our interplay practices and just improving singing. And they looked at me really wide and then they just went for it. Right. Cause it was fun and it was, and it was joyful. And we started the day, you know, checking in with ourselves. So, um, yeah. And I, and I know that works, you know, I do that sometimes in tense environments. I'll just start humming and it does change the energy. What were you going to say, Kelsey? Did you want to jump in and give feedback or anything? I see you coming off mute. Oh, no, go ahead. You finish your thought and I can. Okay. Let's see where I was. So Christine, you were talking about humming the nibblings, school transitions. Where was I going? I'll let you go, Kelsey. If it comes back, I'll come back. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Um, so it sounded like there was a question in there about our ability to hold both. Um, yes. Both the impulse to navigate very full lives and make space for care and rest and connection. And how do we do that? And one thing that I find so powerful about somatic work And somatic work is relating to the body, the soma. Um, The soma is a Greek word that means the the organism in its wholeness. So oftentimes people think of the soma as just the body, but our soma is also our connection to spirit 
It's also our connection to our thinking selves, our feeling selves, our um, interconnected group body. So when we're tuning into somatics, we're looking at all these layers of our aliveness and what it means to be a human organism and what supports life and what gets in the way of life. So one beautiful thing is as we start to tune into that question of like, well, how do I take care of myself as a human being? How do I take care of these layers of my soma? What we start to feel for is how incredibly we are designed to hold complexity. We so often in our bodies, we can see this. We can feel excited and also feel a little nervous. We can feel like joyous and happy. And also we can feel a little bit sad. Uh, we can feel multiple sensations. We can feel our heart beating and our chest pounding, but we can also feel the strength of our legs and our rootedness to ground. And so what we tend to do without somatic practice is that we identify what, with whatever feels the loudest or the most uncomfortable. So if it's our heart pounding, then we're like, I'm anxious. And we forget oh, wait, I also feel really strong. I also can feel my connection to ground. I can also feel, right? So we're building our capacity to be with all these different things that are happening in our body. And so this question of like, well, how do we like have children and have jobs and have, you know, have all these things that we right. need to manage and navigate. And at the same time, make space for rest and connection. What tends to happen is we think I have to be either doing one or the other. And what we can learn how to do is to even in the midst of our very full lives, make space to tune into what's happening in my body right now. Where is this impulse coming from? What sensations are here? And is there something I need to take care of in this moment? And this can happen in very small but profound ways. Like, oh, um, I'm I'm on this call right now, right? And what I could do is like, I could lean over myself and be a little bit um, imbalanced. But if I take a moment and notice, it's like, oh, actually, I want to lean back. And just before we started the call, I had my legs crossed and I was kind of balancing myself. I was like, oh, actually, I want to place both of my feet on the ground right now. I can feel the support of this backrest. I can feel my legs on the ground. And that changes how I show up in this conversation. And it shifts my energy in which I'm making room for more of myself and more of my values as I am living my very full, complex life. Mm. Yes, to making more room for yourself. Yes. And I think going back, the the point that I was thinking about is the holding both, like you said, right? But it was the holding both knowing that no matter if I'm a kitchen manager or a server, my value is still the same as an asset and the type of team member that I am to the company, right? Um, and to myself as a person in general. And also knowing that when I walked into this convenience store with the I can't breathe shirt on, somebody f- thought that they had the room to be able to have a very familiar conversation with me when this woman did not know me, you know? So what we know from psychology is that you don't hold two things in your mind at once. You're right, right? We cannot hold both. And also just like grief and these other things that we talked about, it's not always necessarily about us holding the weight of it. It's not mine to hold, right? This person and how what they think based on a shirt and what they think they know about me from looking at me is not my responsibility to, to hold the weight of that. But it is my responsibility if I want to maintain my wholeness and my wellness to know that ooh, maybe this is why she thought she could ask me that question and then go back to my value and say, okay, this is how I'm going to respond. 
instead of reacting a certain type of way, you know, and that's the balance of it in your physical, because that takes you to a certain place, but being able to remember where I'm grounded, start from my non-negotiables, hopefully, you know, pouring from a, a cup that's full and overflowing, we can respond to things and stay in a place of centeredness and wholeness and continue to process while acknowledging what's going on and what we need to do to move forward. Kelsey, you have generously offered our listeners of Women Connecting with some podcasts your giveaway of five practices to come home to your body workbook um, when folks sign up to your newsletter. Yes, um, yes, that's right. I, my next question was like, hey, y'all, this is a great place to take a break and hear from our awesome sponsors that make Women Connected and Wisdom podcast possible. Shannon, we are so grateful that Shayla Glow is the sponsor of the Women Connected in Wisdom podcast. And I wanted to take this moment to ask you, when you think about the people who use Shayla Glow, who are we talking about? Mm, that's a good question. I think about three groups, really. One, the group that's removing hair, right? So whether you're using laser hair removal, waxing, shaving, you got to make sure that you're putting back what you're taking out. The second group, I think about those with dry skin and the problems that that might cause, right? The scars, itching, burning, whatever the situation is, you definitely need all three steps, right? The exfoliation, making sure you're taking the dead skin cells off, the oil, putting in the, the moisture and then the shea butter with the aloe, sealing it, helping you heal those things help both groups, right? And third, for the third group is those with chronic illness. You know, the story is personally from cancer and different diseases that our population is dealing with on a daily basis throughout families as individuals. So I'm thinking about my mom and my grandmother and those around me with the same generational ties, right? And what positive healthy habits we can start to make sure that we're maintaining our wellness, especially because the skin is like the cape, the exterior, the, the shield for your immune system. So with COVID, we have to be intentional about covering ourselves. And those are the groups I think about. I love it. And you know what else I love about your product? It's all natural, handmade, yes. and it smells great, y'all. So yes, as yay. Tested. <laughs> yes, <laughs> esthetician tested and approved. Yes. Yes. What about you? When you think about your company, what groups of people do you think about? Well, you know, I work with individual coaching clients. I work in community classes and with corporate teams. And with all of them, I use a strength-based embodied approach to help folks connect with themselves and access joy, reduce burnout, and build resilience. You know, especially during these times, I think we need it. I think we need all the hashtag partnership power we can get. <laughs> yes. If somebody doesn't know, you know, like we're... Our society, and we talk about it often on the podcast, so as you can imagine, because we've had yeah. multiple inner players on, but like, what do you say? Like, what's, what's one practice to get somebody to start being in touch with their body and in tune with their body? If they're like, wait a second, that's me. And, and uh -huh. I'm not connected. Yeah. Yeah. What, what do you yeah. recommend? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I, I heard you mentioning the taking a deep breath and letting it out with a sigh. So that's always a good one. And it sounds like your readers may be familiar with that. But, you know, taking a deep breath, letting it out with an audible sigh, the body can't really get enough of that. Um, it's such a good one. In fact, I think let's do it right now. Yes. Yeah. And then I always like to notice, like, what am I feeling on the other side of engaging with that practice? Right. Like my eyes always get a little like dreamy. <laughs> um, but uh, in addition to that practice, I mean, I think that everyone has a different, you know, history as it relates to what's happening in their body. And for many of us, this disconnection from our body is actually a wise adaptation to living inside of systemic oppression. We have learned not to feel because if we feel, we won't be able to take care of what we need to take care of in our very full lives and with all the people who depend on us. So 
feel coming into relationship with the body can feel really scary when we know that our body is holding painful histories. And in my work, I also am looking at intergenerational trauma and how that's held in the body, right? And so if our body is one in which we know that this is a big chasm to cross, right? Like I think of that Indiana Jones, like drop it bridge across the chasm. If we yes. know that this is going to be like, this is work we want to do, but it's also work that feels a little bit overwhelming, then I, I really recommend working with a, a trauma-informed practitioner, working with a somatic coach, right? Somebody who you can, who can walk alongside you and help you titrate, which means ease in and ease out of that experience. That said, one of the best ways that we learn and interplay to start to build a reconnection with the body is through practices that bring us joy. So rather than making it this big project, like I know I'm one of those numbing people and I need, and I know my body carries trauma and, you know, I have clients who show up like this and they're like, let's get to work. I'm ready. I've, I'm ready. You know, I'm ready. Let's go. I'm like, right. I love that you are so committed. And I love, I love that, but let's find it. Let's find a way in that feels gentle and let's find right. a way in that feels more playful and light. And so one really easy way to do this uh, that anyone can do is to put on a, a piece of music you really like. So for me, I love to dance to earth, wind and fire. If you put earth, wind and fire on, I guarantee you that my body is going to want to do something. So you can do That's this true. at home by yourself. You might feel silly. You might, feel self-conscious, that's okay. That's okay. You can, you, you let yourself be in that awkwardness. That's an indication yes. that you're leaning into something. You don't want to overwhelm yourself, but it's okay if it feels awkward. And just turn on that piece of music and stand up. Don't look in front of a mirror. Don't try to, and just let your body move however it wants to move. And that may mean it, you move vigorously and you have a lot of activity, or it may mean, you, you know, you, you just sway and hum. And that's, that's your practice. That's your practice for reconnecting right now. Beautiful. Well, you know, from our introduction, Kelsey, we're not afraid of being awkward. <laughs> and I, I literally think about it like, dance like nobody's watching <laughs> In this little box, because <laughs> they're watching, right? <laughs> I'm. I mean, yes, exactly. Yeah. It's important that we normalize. Like, hey, you know, we have bodies, and yeah. for some reason, we have. You know, not for some reason. We know why, but we've been taught that there's something wrong with right. how we are in our bodies. No, no. I love how you said holding complexities. You know, and what I talk about in the beginning of my chapter in volume two is unmitigated financial freedom, right? But what I love about the eight dimensions of wellness is that I really want us to have unmitigated freedom everywhere. That's just the topic of that chapter, right? Um, or part of that paragraph. But when we talk about epigenetics and generations of memories and things that Th this version of the spirit was not there for this generation in the family was not there for, but still holds, right? Because we know that things are equal and opposite, there can be equal and opposite reaction. What I look forward to from our conversation and what we're doing here is the compound and the exponential healing, you know, so more people can take deep breaths and come back and be healthier sooner and learn how to process in a healthy way. I love how you said the soma is the whole part of it, right? It's your spirit. It's the thinking, the feeling, the interconnectedness. So when we're empathetic and, you know, your your friend, your business partner, the the person that you're with or somebody that you work with has stuff going on and you care about this person, well, it makes sense why you might feel compelled to pick up that weight. But again, it's not yours to pick up. 
you can hold space with people and come back to yourself or, you know, how we talk about the balance between self and community care and continue it from that, from that conversation. So outside of that, I want to ask you, Kelsey, about how all this connects to the confidence, the dignity, and the self-worth that we can operate in while we're working on decolonizing the body and staying in tune with ourselves through the things that we do on a daily basis. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, the truth is that we all are inherently worthy and inherently dignified Yes, and inherently whole. Everyone. Yes. Yes. But because of systems of domination, the impacts of the colonial project, which to just define what colonization is, is when an external power asserts dominion over a people and a land. So some some, um, power comes in and takes control of another um, land in the, in, you know, that's not under their dominion. Right. And colonization has happened over it, it, the entire world has been impacted by the colonial project or settler colonialism, right. except for one country with, which is Ethiopia, <laughs> um, but everywhere else. And so because of the impacts of colonization and the impacts of, um, capitalism, uh, racialized capitalism, right? That require, there's a requirement of continual extraction in order to concentrate resources for the plutocratic few, which is the people who already have all the power. And there is no completion in that project. And so that is outside of the laws of nature to continually be extracting. That's not how the the, uh, natural world operates. There's a distortion there. And so that distortion requires uh, a reorganization, a systemic reorganization in order to exact its aims. And what we determined societally is that race would be that reorganization. That in order to continue keep this project in operation, we needed to have a hierarchical ranking of bodies so that some bodies would be on top and other bodies would be on bottom. And that hierarchical ranking, it impacted not just what what resources were available to us or what roles we were expected to play in society or how disposable our bodies were. But it also impacted how we feel internally. So we're talking here about internalized oppression. And even when we know that we have worth and we know we have dignity, we may find ourselves operating against that knowledge in our daily lives. We may, like example, we walk down the street and somebody is approaching us. Do we step to the side or do we hold our space? Uh, Somebody challenges what we say. Do we hold our ground and say, actually, or do we swallow, right? And the truth is we still live inside of a system that is in, there's inequality, right? And so some of these adaptations may still be needed in order to protect our safety and protect our bodies. But what happens is they get, generalized so that we're um, we're exerting these adaptations in situations when there might be possible, it might be possible for us to have a little bit more of our dignity and to take up yes. a little bit more space, uh-huh. right? But taking up that space can feel really unfamiliar, especially if what was modeled to us by our mother and her mother and so on and so forth is that we stay small. We don't challenge authority. We get by, 
right? And again, this may not, these may not be things we think, but they show up in our tissues, in our muscles. And so that's what we're tuning to in the practice of decolonization is how do I align what I know? I know that I am worthy. I know that I deserve abundance. I know that my voice deserves to be heard. How do I align that with actually how I am moving and operating in my physical body? Beautifully said. Mm. Thank you, Kelsey. Yeah. My pleasure. Thanks for asking. I think um, I know we've got to to move before too long to our wisdom and action. But when you were talking, um, what kept bubbling up for me, and I haven't seen it yet, full transparency, it's on the list. I've just been moving too quick. Um, have you seen the Barbie movie yet? Oh yeah. Or read about the read about the monologue? Yes. At the end. Yes. That was what kept bubbling up for me. I was like. Your work is right in alignment with that of of those all the isms and and yeah. what it feels like in our bodies, right? Yes, yes. And the other thing I'll say about this work is that when we start to unravel from the ways these adaptations are generalized in our somas. It is uncomfortable. It it can be disorienting. And so one of the things that is so essential in the way that I do this work of decolonizing is that we are opened up and in relationship with that which is larger than us. Spirit, the natural world those who have our highest good who carry that in their in their hearts or in their minds right and, and, and that's we can't do it alone which is a myth of capitalism and the meritocracy i can be decolonized if i work hard enough i will be free okay. no there's no, we are not arriving right now mm-hmm. We're in a stream of unlearning in service to future generations. We will not be decolonized in our lives. But just having this conversation and starting to think about what this could mean is turning our awareness and opening our imagination to new possibilities that the next generation will hopefully take forward. So I stand in the stream of all of those many great teachers who brought this consciousness to my awareness, Audre Lorde, Fannie Lou Hamer, right? Um, Yes. Yeah. Bell Hooks. Bell Hooks, right. That's what I was about to say. Bell Hooks. Hooks. Yes. And the Um, list goes on. Right. Mm. The list goes on. The list goes on. Mm. Oh, thank you for your wisdom and your words today, Kelsey. This is such, I feel like we need to have you back. I feel like we could just keep talking. This is so good. And Dude. it's about that time. So Shannon. Oof. So every week we do a wisdom in action, right? Based on the dimension that we're talking about. So today we're talking about physical wellness. We're talking about decolonizing the body. I have a couple of hashtags that I wrote down. Okay. So I think that, like you said, Christine, earlier this week, I'm going to choose two. Okay. And one is internalized freedom because right for your physical body. And again, it's the daily practices of choosing to be well in the midst of learning, unlearning these things. Right. Um, For me is internalized freedom on a daily basis. And then the second one, because we are celebrating Devon's life tonight and I stand in the stream, I think about, so that is the hashtag, excuse me, let me pause. I stand in the stream, 
right? I loved when you said that. And that's for all of us, right? The interconnectedness that you talked about earlier. Sometimes when people look at the relationships I have, they're like, why are you still talking to this person? Or why are you still, why are you, people have all these questions, you know, but it's about the personal relationship. Okay, this system that we're talking about, whether it's the workplace, whether it's the government, the country around the world, like different things we could talk about. What about this one person? Right. Because everybody is worth it. Everybody is worth being whole. Everybody is worth being seen. And so no matter what was going on in the system, me and this person were connected. I'm going to check on them. And so us being able to be together as a Papado family is super special. It's part of why I started Shalo Globus washing our hands at the sink. And that has helped so many people take better care of themselves and their physical wellness. So I stand in the stream for us and us all being intentional on daily healthy habits. Yes. What about you two ladies? What are your wisdoms in action? Wisdoms? Is that a thing? Plural wisdom? What are you doing? <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't remember what that is. Um, I got you. Could so, you remind me? Absolutely. So we talked about a lot. Right. And they can be like, oh, my goodness, decolonization, the hierarchy. What are you ladies talking about? Sometimes it's a lot to take the knowledge and then put it into action. Right. And we can know all this stuff. But if in the situation you're approached by this woman that's asking you this question and you don't put the knowledge into action, it's not necessarily wisdom. Right. So we talk about the topics and bring our stuff to the table. And then we say personally, as professionals and business leaders who do this work. What are we doing for ourselves to maintain our physical wellness? Okay, got it. So here is what I will say. Um, and this was advice given to me by one of my teachers, Mbali Murray, who's um, an elder and wisdom holder. And she, uh, she told me to create a sit spot outside and to sit in that spot for just five minutes a day and to tune into each one of my senses. And to do it every day, and I will be transformed. And so I am in that practice, and it is changing me. And that is what I will offer to your readers or your listeners. That's oh, I love that. Um, my wisdom in action, I made a lot of notes, too. I had written down, Shannon, the one of Stand in the Stream. Yes. And I also think my hashtag is practice in joy. So whatever my physical wellness this week, because I am traveling, whether it's walking or playing in the park with the nibblings, I'm going to practice in joy. Yes. So. Yes. And I love when you said that, um, Kelsey, about bringing in the joy. You know, I, I could be that person. OK, these are this is the goal. This is how we're going to do it the smart way. Right. But wait a minute, like have some fun with it. Let's bring it in so we can make it sustainable and, you know, keep the work going for us and the future generations. Thank you so much. Mm, Kelsey, thank you for being with us. We are going to put all of your contact info, not all of it. We're not giving them everything, but you know, your website, your, um, how can, well, let me just ask you before we go, how can people best connect with you? Yeah. So I am launching my Substack, um, and it, it will be in the show notes, but it's kelseyblackwell.substack.com. The name of it is the drinking gourd. Um, which I say more about that. Uh, there's a lot of um, re relevance to decolonization and the drinking gourd. Uh, so yes. please follow me and check that out. Mm, fabulous. Thank you for being on Women Connected Wisdom podcast today. We yes. are so grateful to be connected to you. And um, we just really... It was our honor to lift up your work and your voice today. And uh, I hope our listeners will go get your book, Decolonizing yes. the Body by Kelsey Blackwell. Join her substack. Y'all, you want to be connected to Kelsey. Yes. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much for having me. Thanks, Kelsey. Absolutely. Oh. oh, my goodness. So good. I have so <laughs> many things I want to talk about and wrap, but. Y'all, I got to jump off and go get some nibblings from school. Go get so, the nibblings, Tia. <laughs> so, so you want to, anything you want to say, Shannon, that uh, we need to lift up for our listeners before we close episode yes. 127? 
Yes, yes. So we talked about a lot, right? We knew even titling this podcast that doing this work can be a lot of work. And so this weekend, we're talking about decompression and how to do that at the retail space. So if you guys want to come down and join us in person, that is going to be from one to four. And the information is on the Shalo Glow Instagram. And outside of that, stay tuned for our audio book so that you can listen to it if you haven't had the opportunity to read the print book. And volume two is on the way. Whoop, 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 whoop. Yes. So much goodness. Yes. Thank you guys so much for joining us for the beginning of season 15. We'll see you live here next week. In the meantime, don't forget. Be well. Be wise. And be whole. We'll see you soon. Peace. Thanks for listening. This has been the Women Connected in Wisdom podcast. On air live on Wednesdays at 5 p.m. Eastern via Facebook and YouTube. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe. Be part of the conversation and get connected at womenconnectedinwisdom.com.